It's such an adventure to go foraging. I love the hiking aspect because I, I just like being out in nature and I like walking in the mountains. Like just the discovery, the finding of it is like a treasure hunt. So I'm making an elderflower liqueur. Fill this up with elderflower as much as possible. Cover it with alcohol. Let it sit for a little bit, a couple weeks maybe, and add some sugar. It's really simple, simple recipe. But I'd go with easy because it's my first time making anything with elderflower. So, elderflower has a really delicate flavor. It's floral, it's very light. Um, but it goes, goes well with sweet things. I really like elderflower syrup and I wanted to make that, but slightly more complicated recipe. The first time I tried the elderflower syrup was in Padova. One of my friends um, gave me some that our family makes every year. And oh, it was so good, I loved it. Some of the same fruit trees that my grandmother picked from as a child still grow here. Neighbors tell me that the twisted old mulberry tree in front of the house is the only one of its kind in this area. We also have a few ancient pear cultivars, cherry trees, a walnut tree. I'm hoping to propagate these trees from cuttings so that we can keep growing the same fruit. The woods around this house are full of wild blackberry and other plants like hawthorn, blackthorn, and dog rose, whose berries can be used to make jellies. There are greens like chicory and stinging nettles, and wild mushrooms like chanerelles, porcini, and black truffles. One thing I've been puzzling over recently is that I can't recall my grandmother ever cooking the typical meals of this area. I think the reason might be that she didn't have time to learn. Her father worked in the United States during much of her childhood, saving money for their eventual move. So she and her brother needed to take on extra duties for managing their farm. I'm trying to learn, but it's difficult without guidance. 
This kind of traditional knowledge is so hard won, but so easily lost. Wild boars nested here. After nightfall, we often hear dogs barking in the distance as they roam these hills. Thankfully, we haven't crossed paths yet. Oh my goodness. I'm so excited about this walnut. Um, this tree is really special. So it was here when my grandmother was living here. What I've heard is that this tree has a nut that is kind of larger than usual and the shell also opens kind of easily. So for that reason, it's kind of, you know, a nice fruit. These trees smell so good. Um, they have this wonderful fragrance, like almost citrusy in a way. And that smell shows up when you burn its wood as well. So as a firewood, it's a really nice firewood because it has a, a special fragrance. Um, unfortunately, somebody cut this tree down uh, without permission a few years ago. But it was taken uh, by one of our renters, one of our former renters. Um, all that was left was this stump with two suckers growing out of the stump which I've left to to grow into trees and so far they're growing quickly I really hope we can save it I hope we can propagate it I've tried but so far it hasn't worked oh it smells it smells so good like even just even just standing under it you can you can smell it. Could you imagine like a whole like forest of walnut trees, the way it must smell, that, that fragrance. It's just, just incredible. And you know what else? Um, not far from here. I remember one of the, not the first time that I came, but maybe the second or third time. I was walking uphill with one of the neighbors here and we were discussing something and all of a sudden I started to smell something in the air. I just stopped and had to ask him what that was. It was wild mint. There's this wild mint that grows here and it just kind of perfumes the air, right? So you're standing in these places and you'll be, you know, just walking through the woods here and all of a sudden the smell of walnut or heading out toward the fields and some very light scent of mint just kind of wafts wafts towards you. I love that about this place.
So over time, the lime plaster has kind of separated from the stone wall itself. There's no longer bonding between the plaster and the wall, so we'll have to redo that. The first thing that we need to do is to remove any loose mortar between the stone joints and replace it with new mortar, new lime-based mortar. To the extent possible, we only use lime products. Working with lime is slower than working with modern cement because it takes a longer time to cure. But the advantage is that lime-based mortars are suited to stone buildings, whereas cement isn't. Cement is actually harder than stone, so what will happen is as a building settles over time, um, a wall will act as a solid mass and any fractures will split right through stone. Lime-based mortar is designed to fail first. So when there's settling or when the building moves at all, um, the mortar will break first and it's replaceable. So it's something that's supposed to be maintained over time. Modern cement mortars can also cause dampness problems, sometimes so severe that stone itself may disintegrate. Lime mortars have an important role to play in managing moisture within walls. Lime is basically made by burning limestone rock until it chemically changes into calcium oxide, also called quicklime. Quicklime reacts strongly with water, this is called slaking, and converts into lime putty, which then slowly reabsorbs atmospheric carbon dioxide and converts back into limestone. This process is called the lime cycle. 
A basic lime mortar is just sand and lime, but the properties of the mortar can vary considerably depending on how the lime is made, the type of sand used, and how the mortar is prepared. My grandmother once told me that when the lower part of this building was built, she remembered the workers bringing quicklime and slaking it in a pile of sand on site here. Until now, we've been using pre-mixed NHL 3.5 lime mortars. NHL stands for natural hydraulic lime. 3.5 refers to its minimum compressive strength in megapascals. We'll use the few bags we have remaining, but as I've been studying, I'm having second thoughts about using it. NHLs are comparatively modern technology. They were developed in the 18th century to be able to cure even in wet conditions, for example, underwater or below ground, by using limestone that contains clay and certain other minerals. Over time, they became widely used in conservation of stone buildings in much of Europe, and for a long time, the story was that they should perform similarly to traditional lime mortars. However, I've recently learned that there is some debate about the properties of these NHLs, even supposedly weaker NHL2, for example. There are important questions about the maximum compressive strength that these mortars reach over time, their free lime content, and most crucially, I think, the microscopic capillary structure within the mortar. One criticism I've heard is that many NHLs may lack the correct capillary structure. I've heard anecdotes of many buildings that were repointed with NHL mortars decades ago that now have persistent dampness problems. Pointing has very important consequences for a building. I feel uneasy with these debates over the best practices for lime mortar specification. So for now, we'll use the few bags of NHL that we have here, but I'm going to dig deeper into this question before we do major repointing work. Today, people are still trying to understand Roman mortar. To say that we understand lime mortar completely is very far from reality, I think. Working with lime, in my opinion, means accepting that this will be a topic of ongoing lifelong learning. It's like, um, it's for the scratch coat yeah. to catch okay. onto. So you'll scratch the scratch coat too, but this is just dubbing. I get it. Um, it's just to raise the mortar a bit. And of course you don't beat this because you want that to stay. Okay, so that, that, that went pretty well, I think. Good. Yeah. Thank you. 
Okay, all done. Hold on. Thank you.